Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us again on thelatestwith.com. Uh, last week we talked with Dr. Evan Schneider and we had a lot of very interesting questions about uh, neuronal matters and different um, areas of neurons and stem cells. So we're very fortunate today to have with us uh, Dr. Larry Goldstein, who is in San Diego. He's a director of the stem cell program. And um, he's done some very interesting work, which I actually just learned about when I looked at the CV last week, um, with these walking molecules called kinesins. Um, I think you saw the video that I sent out uh, announcing announcing that um, this conversation that we're going to have. So, and also, uh, Dr. Goldstein wrote the book Stem Cell for Dummies, and um, is very actively involved in education of public, as well as doing a lot of great work uh, scientifically. So, with that said, um, maybe Dr. Goldstein, and of course, before we go on, you can, uh, people can ask questions through the chat function at the website here, just underneath the screen. If you click on chat. I see the questions that people are asking. Um, so with that said, maybe Dr. Goldstein, let's go to the very beginning. Maybe you can tell us how you got involved in these very interesting molecules, kinesins, a little bit of background on them and what they do. Yeah, so uh, when I was a graduate student some, some years ago, I'm embarrassed to admit how many, um, I became very interested in the problem of how cells divide and how the chromosomes, the DNA, the genetic material of cells is moved physically when cells divide. And that led to an interest in the proteins that actually generate some of that physical movement and form the foundation for our earliest molecular and biochemical descriptions of how these molecules work and then how they've been diversified to function in different types of cells. That, that work has led to the development of some novel anti-cancer drugs, some novel drugs for heart failure and ALS, and more recently has formed the basis for some new ideas we've developed about what goes wrong in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. The people in our audience who are not familiar with cell biology or who didn't watch the video, so the kinesin's role is to carry subcellular matter between the cell? Or what do they actually right. do? So, so there's, a, there's a commonly held uh, misunderstanding, if you will, among folks who don't work on a daily basis with cells from humans or other animals, which is that things kind of float around inside of cells. And in fact, that's not true. Cells are very highly ordered and there's a great deal of material in there, which means you need a cargo transportation system to move things around. That problem is most acute in neurons, which are the largest cells in the human. They can be as much as three or four feet in length in some cases. And so what they have is they have something like the interstate highway system that they use to move materials from where they're produced to where they're ultimately used in the cell. And that's what we've investigated for the past uh, two decades, I guess I'd say. Mm -hmm. And that's what's led to some of our ideas about disease that we're now trying to test in human systems using human stem cell technologies. So in my background is immunology. So, you know, in immunology, we know, for example, the dendritic cell, it eats up different things, different non-specifically, brings it inside, and then you have the the different uh, subcellular processing. It's the kinesins that take these different uh, vesicles inside and that do all the processing? Is so, so it's a little bit more elaborate than that. Uh -huh. It turns out that in humans and mice and other mammals, there are many, many different types of these proteins, factors that generate force end movement. So again, returning to the interstate highway analogy, if you go out and look at the freeway, what you'll see is that there's all sorts of different types of automobiles and trucks and motorcycles. They all use a common principle, which is the internal combustion engine, but they harness it to different sorts of cargoes depending on what's mounted on the back end, if you will. And that enables cells to generate a wide variety of different movements inside of them, ranging from the phagocytic process that you just mentioned to cell division 
the movement of all sorts of substances as well as those needed for the normal physiology of the neuron. This is extremely fascinating to me. It reminds me of some ways, because it seems to be kind of a non-specific, but there is obviously an element of specificity. So maybe you can tell me, maybe you can tell me um, um, in a dendritic cell, for example, the kinesins involved in phagocytosis, are those similar molecularly to the kinesins involved in a neuronal transport of, let's say, neurotransmitters? Are they, how similar are they? I mean, the reason why I'm asking is you mentioned targeting. Is it possible to target specific cellular functions, make a small molecule inhibitor of, let's say, um, phagocytosis? Or are they pretty much the same? Yeah, so, so the phagocytic process has not had a lot of work done on it yet. Uh, in my lab or in other labs to try to elucidate which of these specific molecules are involved. But for example, if you look at some of the drugs that was developed that were dr developed by this company that I co-founded some years ago called Cytokinetics, those drugs in the cancer area target specific different molecules that generate chromosome movement or movement of the microtubules, for example, in the oncology programs, or in the heart failure program, they specifically improve the force output of the molecular motor that generates heart contraction, for example, and does not have, they do not have much of an effect on muscles of other types. And so, yes, molecules can be found that have extraordinary specificity, and that specificity seems to be holding up through clinical trials as they advance through clinical development. Wow, this is very exciting. So basically with the company, for all our biotech entrepreneurs who are watching it, you set up a screening system to target specific kin uh, kinesins or, or how, and then you screen different molecules or maybe you can that's tell a fact, Yes, that's effectively how it's done. I mean, okay. so it turns out that these molecules have very favorable biochemistry for a variety of reasons. And so they can withstand the kinds of high throughput uh, screening systems that you need to go through, not just initial chemical libraries, but then to do the kind of medicinal chemistry that's needed prior to serious preclinical development and then ultimately clinical trials. Wow. So in the company, were you able to get patents issued on the actual screening methods or the patents were on the hits you identified? Oh, uh, you know, you'd have to look at the company website to get chapter and verse on all their intellectual property at this point, but they've, they've done quite well setting up uh, uh, a fairly good intellectual property suite to protect what they're doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, uh, this is very interesting. So, last point about the, this aspect. You're saying that with small molecule screening, we can actually find ways of upregulating kinesin activity, not just downregulating it. Well, so in the heart, it's a, it's a motor molecule called myosin, and that's a program that was developed at Cytokinetics based in part on what we discovered about the molecular motors of the kinesin type, and based in part on the expertise of my co-founders and collaborators on that project who worked on myosins. So, yes, you can increase the force output of these types of molecules. And it turns out that retrospectively, when one thinks about what we know about the biochemistry, it's, it's in a sense apparent from the biochemistry that they're highly tunable, both in an evolutionary sense as well as now in a chemical sense. Okay, this is excellent. So let's move on really quickly to um, with ALS and with Alzheimer's. That's a very interesting. Um, one of my colleagues, Michael Agagenian, who is watching, um, he published on Plus One the, some work on Alzheimer's vaccine. So maybe you can tell us a couple of words on Alzheimer's and kinesins and, and your work on that aspect. Uh, well, that's a fairly long story, but I'll try to cut it short. So what we, we and others discovered some years ago is that when you make genetic changes in animal models, you find that there are pathologies that develop that are reminiscent of some of the pathologies that you see in Alzheimer's disease. And so that made us wonder whether defects in the movement systems might be part of what develops in Alzheimer's disease. And so we spent a number of years probing that issue in both fruit fly models of disease as well as mouse models of disease. 
in the past five years, I concluded that we've probably gone about as far as we can with those animal models and need to begin working on human materials because there are quite substantial biochemical differences between human neurons and mouse neurons and fruit fly neurons. And so while the studies on model organisms revealed some important principles, to really get to the point where we can develop drugs that perhaps target the movement systems or other systems that may fail in diseases of the Alzheimer's type, we really do need to now work on human neurons, which is what we're doing in my lab. Excellent. So, but just so I understand, the, in Alzheimer's, what happens? You have these polymer type proteins, right? The, the, what is it, the tau or something? What, what is well, so, that? So, uh -huh. the, the first thing to remember is that there is not yet proof as to what the basic defective biochemical process is that causes Alzheimer's disease. And the failure, or let me put it a different way, the lack of a complete understanding of what goes wrong in brain cells in this disease is part of the reason, I believe, that we don't yet have effective therapeutic agents. There are, there are animal models of Alzheimer's. Major uh -huh. ideas about what goes wrong is the so-called amyloid cascade hypothesis which proposes that altered processing and handling of a protein called amyloid precursor protein leads to the formation of so-called amyloid plaques, which are visible aggregates in the brains of people who have this disease. And that those proteins and those plaques lead to all of the downstream pathologies, including defects in the movement system, defects in the ability to maintain communication between neurons, and ultimately the failure of memory and cognition. Now that hypothesis has been tested in a number of ways in humans in the vaccine trials, and the hypothesis, in my opinion, has not held up very well. Uh -huh. And so we really need to find some new ideas about what's going wrong in the disorder either as primary lesions or secondary lesions, because they all provide potential targets for therapy development. Wow, so I, I didn't realize that the amyloid hypothesis was just a hypothesis. So just to make sure I understand, you are telling me that we do not know the molecular mechanism or the causative mechanism of Alzheimer's in people? That's correct. So there are certainly strong proponents of the amyloid cascade, the amyloid hypothesis, but it is far from proven. See, this is why I love doing this show, is because I learn something new every day. Really, last question here, I don't want to beat this, uh, to, uh, but what are these triple transgenics? They have some kind of transgenics that develop Alzheimer's, and I thought that was a black and white Animals food. that were generated in Frank LaFerla's lab at UC Irvine, they're mouse versions of Alzheimer's disease that generate many of the typical pathologies. But it is, it is quite unclear, in my opinion, and the opinion of some others, as to what degree of fidelity, how accurately they model the true human disease. So, I mean, I'll just tell you that I'm not a big fan of the amyloid hypothesis. But if you were to, for example, interview somebody who is a fan of the amyloid hypothesis, they would make very persuasive arguments to you about why I'm incorrect. And I would do likewise on, on the converse. Uh -huh. And of course, that's the nature of a scientific debate. And what we need is more information and more data to really establish whether this is what's going on in humans. And in fact, whether the amyloid hypothesis is correct about what truly drives disease. Now... Do you study multiple sclerosis at all? No. No, because it, it reminds me in some ways, um, my background is immunology, so obviously I believe multiple sclerosis is an immunological disease. If you inject mice with myelin basic protein, they develop a disease that resembles human multiple sclerosis. If you look at biopsy samples of patients, you see T-cell infiltration and so on. But there's different hypotheses of multiple sclerosis being made by different types of pathogens, um, even associated with Lyme disease. And I always thought that that's something very much to the fringe of science. But that's why I'm very interested now to hear with Alzheimer's that 
I thought uh, the amyloid hypothesis was a fact, so uh, this is very new for me. Last question about this. Um, so your idea then is, and the data, I've seen you had a paper in Science with clinical samples, that there is a, a subcellular, intracellular transport defect? Well, what is your idea of, of the alternative, I guess, to the hypothesis? Yes, we, we think and are trying to test carefully that there is an early defect in the movement and traffic control system in neurons that occurs in disease and that that leads to the subsequent failures in the neurons and accounts for a great many of the misbehaviors that are observed. It's a, it's a different way of looking at the problem. It's useful in two senses. One is an, it's an interesting scientific hypothesis that needs to be tested, but it also does provide a potential road forward for therapy development by targeting these systems biochemically. Excellent. We started having questions. Um, we had a bunch of questions. I didn't realize they were popping up. Um, let me, actually very quickly, before I get to these questions, uh, tell me really uh, ALS, uh, what, what happens in ALS? I, uh, superoxide dismutase, I thought. I know it's only in familial, but... Um, yeah, actually, the, the genetic changes in superoxide dismutase are the cause of one rare form of hereditary ALS. It has been a very well-studied animal model of ALS. We've done quite a bit of work on it in collaboration with my friend and colleague Don Cleveland here at UCSD. Um, we started working on it some years ago with uh, Don Cleveland, partly because we had some technologies operating in the lab that enabled us to do some important experiments and partly because we were suspicious that there might be movement defects in ALS as well. To be honest, at this point, we've pursued very little about the possible defects in movement, but have tried to move aggressively towards the development of a therapy for ALS using stem cell-derived materials based on the experiments that we did in the mouse version of ALS in the past uh, eight or 10 years. Wow, this is... What, but really quickly, what, what kind of stem cell drive materials, if you can talk about that, are, are you looking at for ALS? Sure, yeah. So, so in essence, let's take a step back and talk about what we learned from studying the animal versions of ALS, which is what happens in ALS is that the motor neurons, the parts of the nervous system that control the ability of muscles in my hands and fingers and arms to move or in my diaphragm so that I can breathe, those cells, for reasons that we don't completely understand, they die. And so people who have the disease lose the ability to swallow and breathe and move. It's, it's what's responsible for the paralysis. The experiments that we did in mice and that my colleague Don Cleveland did in mice have led to the hypothesis that even though it is the motor neurons themselves that are dying, the surrounding cells in the spinal cord, whose normal job is to provide support and interaction for those motor neurons, that they are defective as well. And that by introducing new versions of those cells by transplantation, we might be able to uh, reduce the death of motor neurons and therefore slow or perhaps someday halt disease progression. Now, different groups have worked on different types of cells in the spinal cord. We have focused on a kind of cell called an astrocyte. And so we've been using human embryonic stem cells to generate precursors to those astrocytes. And we are, over the course of the next year or so, going to be testing those in rat models of ALS to confirm what we've learned from experiments in mice in our lab and in other labs using genetic tricks uh, that mimic the same kind of uh, experiments. And okay. so if mm -hmm. those experiments are successful and we can prove that there is both safety in animal models as well as potential efficacy, then we can move ahead to the filing of an IND, we hope, and the initiation of clinical trials. Very, very exciting. Um, Bob Herman, um, who's treated more than 9,000 animals with fat, autologous fat stem cells, and he was our guest here before, he's asking a couple of very relevant questions. Um, number one, he's asking, why are the motor neurons dying in ALS, 
is an autoimmune. And, um, I, to, in some of my little, some of my work with the superoxide dismutase mice and um, as some of the uh, people who I've worked with, uh, there's some very interesting data with lymphocyte activation, also complement activation in ALS uh, patients and in the animals. What are your thoughts about why they're dying? Is there an autoimmune hypothesis there? I mean, there is an autoimmune hypothesis that's been floating around, but, but to be honest, I think that the data are not very strong in support of that. Certainly, there are reports in the literature that there may be something there, but the fact is most of the experiments I'm aware of have not really supported that strongly. And so I think in the mainstream field, that's an idea that is for the moment fallow, waiting for stronger evidence to perhaps appear someday or for approaches based on manipulating the nervous system directly to, uh, to, to yield an effective therapeutic. I think in, in response to the question, what is it about the environment of the motor neurons as well as the motor neurons themselves that kills them, that's not entirely clear, either in the SOD form or in other recently discovered genetic forms, nor, for example, in sporadic disease where there's quite a bit of information that just really hasn't been obtained. In some ways, it's, it's fairly early in the game in terms of understanding the mechanism, the exact details of what goes wrong in that disease. There's one drug approved, Rylusone, Rylus, I can't pronounce it. It's, uh, what, what does that do? Iliazole, yeah. which affects um, the reuptake of a molecule called glutamate which is used for sending inputs into the motor neuron. And there is a small statistical effect of Rilyazol in prolonging life in patients. But my understanding from talking to patients and from talking to the clinical community is that the effect is not substantial enough that the patients actually notice that they've had an effect and it extends life at most a few months. Yeah, no, it's a terrible, it's a terrible disease. I saw those I can't hear. Can I, I was just saying, it's a, it's a really horrible disease, and it's one that I, I feel very sorry that anybody has to deal with. And so, you know, we're all united in trying to find safe and effective therapies as rapidly as possible and doing the appropriate experiments to be sure those advance into clinical trials as rapidly as we can. Now, the, the one question, um, Genes, have any genes been, I mean, besides uh, SOD, which like you said is in the familial case, any other genes associated with it? Or Yeah, yeah. So, some additional genes have been found in the past couple of years. Uh, one of them is called TDP43, and there's another one called FUS. These are genes that have very different functions in cells, as near as anybody knows at this point, than SOD. Um, and there's a great deal of work on trying to figure out what's going wrong in those cases as well. In the SOD, is it a defective mutation? The SOD just doesn't work, or is it? No, they're not. They're not defective mutations in the way that it, you traditionally think about. Um, and in fact, the the oxidative damage hypothesis, which was developed based on the finding that there were mutations in the SOD gene. Uh, that really doesn't uh, stand up to experimental test. So there's something that's happening in those mutations that leads to that protein having an abnormal function, apparently unrelated to what it ordinarily does in the cell. Okay. Well, do we know what the function is? Well, its ordinary function is to deal with free radicals and to detoxify them. And so uh -huh. it was a very sensible idea that would be what was wrong in these SOD-driven genetic cases of ALS. But the experiments just don't really support that at this point. And that's evidence that comes from a great variety of labs and looks as though it will turn out to be pretty sound. Okay. Uh, no, but really quickly, um, my question was, do we know what the other function of the SOD is, the function that's being mutated? That The aberrant function. Yeah, so the abnormal function that is generated by these genetic changes, very unclear. Th there are many different ideas. Some of the ideas are that it might poison mitochondria, which are the energy um, producing organelles inside the cell. And there are a great many other ideas and they're still being tested. So I think the, the book is not yet uh, written on exactly what's going on.
Now with this for me, and just touching upon the subject, is very exciting because I think for the first time in the history of our species, we can look at diseases and at least have a shot at figuring out everything that's wrong with them. I mean, we're not there yet, but we know all the genes. I, when, when you send me your CV, and my jaw dropped about this project with uh, Craig Vender, that his whole diploid genome has been sequenced and that you're doing some work with that. So I, I think it's very exciting, but before we talk about really exciting things, let's touch really quickly upon how did you get into stem cells? Because when I look at your work, primarily you've done some excellent work in these models. I guess you're using stem cells as a model? Well, so, so, so our original involvement with stem cells scientifically comes from our work in uh, the mouse, where we did a great deal of work using mouse embryonic stem cells to probe how the movement systems in the mouse brain were involved in the support of neuronal viability, as well as the generation of misbehaviors that were similar to what was seen in disease. And so myself and my lab developed a great deal of experience with embryonic stem cells from the mouse. And so when human embryonic stem cells were first described in 1998, not only did I have a policy uh, interest, but it became a very natural scientific transition for my lab, given our interest in human disease, our recognition that our animal models of disease had limitations, uh, particularly for Alzheimer's disease. And so it's led to the development of several projects in the lab using human embryonic stem cells and reprogrammed stem cells to probe the basis of disease in humans, to understand how human genetic variation leads to disease, as well as to develop potential therapies using these new sources of cells. No, because I think in some ways um, the viewers who know me and and the shareholders in my company and so on know that I support adult stem cells, but one of the very interesting and important points that's often overlooked, at least in my opinion, is that we wouldn't know 90% of what we know about molecular biology if it was not for the mouse embryonic stem cell that allowed the creation of transgenic and knockout mice. Um, but tell it, if, if we can touch upon this for a second, with the IPS, the inducible pluripotent stem cell, you've done a lot of work on this. Why are they so exciting? Why are a lot of people getting into this? Well, I think one, there, are, there are two potential very important applications in human biology and human disease for these cells. One is that if one is thinking about transplantation medicine, then being able to transplant genetically matched cells into a recipient means that one can potentially get around the need for immunosuppression. We know that if you do a kidney transplant or a heart transplant between people who are not identical twins, the recipient's immune system will recognize the new organ as being foreign and try to reject it. And so that means there's a great uh, need for people to take immunosuppressive drugs, which have a great deal of side effects. And so the reprogramming technology, by leading to the promise someday of getting to safe, as well as effective, genetically matched cells for therapy, is very exciting and something that I think will make a tremendous difference in the, the decades to come. So that's one important use. A second important use is that the, the genome projects in humans have told us that there's a great deal of genetic variation that we didn't fully appreciate existed. And this genetic variation in many ways appears to be responsible for the differences we each have in our susceptibility to different diseases. And so the reprogrammed stem cells allow us to capture the genomes, the genetic variation of individual people, and in our case to generate brain cells and to study their behavior and to begin to relate the behavior of those brain cells, whether they're diseased or not diseased, back to the patterns of genetic variation and start to probe how does genetic variation in humans 
lead to the development of Alzheimer's disease in many different people. So in a way, it's kind of like the knockout and transgenic technology, but on overdrive, because now we're able to make neurons, human neurons from diseased people, and screen potentially targets, but in a human system. I get that. That's the main idea, I guess. That's 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 right. That's the develop. That's the technology we and others are working on develop, developing. So, there there are twin questions there. One is by understanding how genetic variation leads to disease. It gives us ideas about what goes wrong in the disease, which is, allows us to develop and design better therapeutic approaches. And second, by testing these cells directly with potential drugs and drug candidates, they provide a route forward for therapy, starting initially, of course, with the identification of potential drugs, preclinical development, safety trials, and then clinical trials to establish safety and efficacy. We have a question here um, from, from Bob Herman. Uh, lots of controversy on overseas stem cell therapy. Uh, what is your opinion on minimally manipulated autologous therapy like they do in a canine osteoarthritis in the, for the United States? So is this a question about treating animals or treating people? Treating people. Minimal, there's a big controversy you may have heard yeah, about. Yeah, it. I'm aware of the controversy. Uh -huh. um, I'd have to say that my fundamental position is and always will be that therapies that have been tested in clinical trials double-blind clinical trials and have been proven to be safe and effective, I'm going to be very enthusiastic about. And that there are a great many ideas, wonderful ideas, about how to use autologous stem cells for the treatment of disease. And I think without testing them in clinical trials, it's a little hard to know which ones really will work, which ones will work sometimes, and which conditions different sorts of cells will work for. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. Here's another question along the same lines. Can you comment on the stem cell work outside of the U.S. for production of new myocardium in heart patients? Which specific therapies using which stem cells are most successful? Any serious side effects to date? Wow, that's a huge question. So, you know, as I'm sure you know, the clinical literature is filling up with papers that are testing different sorts of stem cells in different types of transplant systems, as well as for different types of cardiac abnormalities or damage. And I think the early data are that there do appear to be beneficial effects in a small number of trials. The effects are not huge thus far, and there's clearly a great deal of experimental work that needs to be done to figure this out and to figure out what's the safest and most effective path forward. Now, I would not make the distinction between in the U.S. and outside the U.S. I tend to make the distinction between well-regulated environments and less well-regulated environments. I think what you tend to find is that the kind of careful clinical trials that I think and many think is necessary to evaluate which therapies are going to be safe and effective, you find those in well-regulated environments. I have no idea, you know, what goes on in the many different clinics all over the world that are trying or claiming to try many different things. And I think it's hard to know without the kind of transparency you get in well-regulated environments. No, I, I agree. I agree 100 percent in the sense that who in their right mind would support some would, would be against well-regulated trials and well-regulated follow-up on patients. I mean, it's, it's a very logical, very logical um, thing. But let me ask really quickly before we, um, uh, before we continue, let me ask, so what is ISSCR and what is this whole deal oh. with this controversy? Some of the viewers, after I announced that you were coming on the show, were emailing me saying that Dr. Goldstein doesn't like adult stem cells and, and that there is some kind of ISSCR attacking people who do adult stem cells. I, what, what's the whole deal with that? Because I really don't, I've, I've always seen you as a guy who always talks about we got to do trials. 
Well, we got to do trials. No, and I think that's right. So I, I don't, I don't really know why people think that. I, I can't, I can't explain how somebody else thinks. I can tell you how I think. Um, the International Society for Stem Cell Research is an international organization of stem cell scientists, physicians who are trying to develop stem cell-based therapies, ethicists, and legal experts that are working together to advance the field of stem cell science and to bring therapies to humans as rapidly as possible and as safely as possible. Now, if that takes embryonic stem cells or adult stem cells or reprogrammed stem cells, the ISSCR doesn't care. It, it is in favor of all types of stem cell research, whatever is going to get to effective and safe human therapies as rapidly as possible. But the ISSCR also recognizes that there's a great deal that we don't know about which cells will work best, and the only way to figure that out is through responsible, careful, rigorous scientific experiments, and then responsible, careful clinical trials in humans. Exactly. Now, let's. Uh, there's a lot of uh, chatter going on here on on the um, uh, on the question on the chat room. Let me ask this question. Um, there's different clinics that do stem cells inside the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Outside of the U.S., it's been labeled in some ways as a problem, in some ways as a good thing. If there are clinics outside of the U.S. that follow good clinical practices, what do you think is the mechanism of bringing them under the fold and actually, I guess, to put it bluntly, legitimizing their data? What would, what, what would we need to do for, to get... Just, just to I mean, answer... A, yeah. yeah. I, you know, it's a great question, and I think one of the, one of the discussion points at the ISSCR and other scientific and medical societies is how to advance to the point where there are agreed upon international standards so that humans who participate in clinical trials have their ethics and rights protected and so that there is appropriate oversight and so that the human experiments that are the basis of clinical trials are done in a way that's consistent with the well-developed thoughts about ethical conduct that have developed since World War II and are embodied in the Nuremberg Principles and the Declaration of Helsinki and the Belmont Accords. Absolutely, but how do we do that? It takes dialogue. Exactly. So, yes. you know, I, I think one needs to have an international dialogue, but at the same time, one needs to vociferously, loudly discuss what are appropriate standards and why are those standards reasonable so that people who are thinking about visiting a less well-regulated environment are adequately informed about what they may be getting into. Well, you see, this is actually something that I get very, very upset about because there's a lot of people on both sides of the fence who argue and love to argue. But when it comes down to the bottom line, I think it's like what you did with the kinesin when you, were, when you discovered its functions. Something either works or it doesn't work. It's not an opinion question in my mind, and it's just it's, it's something that I think we need to figure out. The point that some people are making here I agree with, which is one of the problems, is funding. Funding in the sense that autologous, several autologous treatments seem to have effect. Like you said, there is not major effect. In some patients, there is a major effect. The big problem, I think, and I'd love your opinion on this, is that for a lot of the autologous methods, it's very difficult to get intellectual property around them. And so because of that, you have certain practices. So for example, in the patients with critical limb ischemia, the Japanese published in 2001 or 2002, I believe, and there's numerous other studies that have demonstrated in subsets of the patient, you have six minute walking time, major improvement. Um, you have a lot of objective benefits in some of them. So I think one thing we need to do that we still haven't figured out as a discipline is inclusion exclusion criteria. We've seen this in the only cell therapy that got FDA approval, to my knowledge, which was Provenge, the cancer vaccine, where you had a very big um, differentiation, different responses, 
and then they had to go back and do a subset analysis. I think that's one of the issues. The other issue I think is for biotech companies that are in the clinical area, the VCs don't understand the model systems, or it's very difficult to get to understand the model systems. And a lot of the charities um, seem to be supporting a lot of the more basic research. Why I say this is several of the CEOs of uh, biotech companies in the area of um, phase one and two, I was quite shocked with one of us specifically that's in phase two telling me that they're getting single digit to low double digit valuations even though they're in the phase two. So there seems to be a problem um, with the, outside the U.S., but especially in the U.S., about funding the clinical trials. Um, how would we approach that? Well, um, I don't know, I'm just throwing that out. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an extremely difficult problem because you're talking about a large-scale social problem. I mean, there are two issues that you've highlighted in your, your remarks there. One is that as as a society, both in the United States and beyond the United States, we're, we're vastly under-invested under -invested publicly in both scientific research and medical research of all sorts. And so the kinds of funding that it would really take to move things forward more aggressively and more rapidly in many cases is not there. And second, you know, because of the pressures of Wall Street and the pressures on short-term return, as well as a certain amount of risk aversion in the biotech space, venture capital and mezzanine funding has largely been drying up for early stage preclinical and clinical development. Those mm -hmm. are problems that need to be solved, and I don't think anybody knows what the solution will look like. And so it's not that those problems make it impossible to responsibly develop, develop therapies. It does slow the process down, which is unfortunate. But yeah. I think the lack of funding should not cause one to violate well, or let me put it a different way, broadly accepted ethical principles for experimentation on human subjects and the need for careful, double-blind, rigorous clinical trials to determine whether a proposed therapy works well, works in some people but not in other people, or actually doesn't really work at all when you do the statistics carefully and uh, take out confounding factors such as placebo effects and observer bias. So just so I understand 100%, ISSCR has no issue with adult stem cells. We no. just have an issue with poor science. We just don't like yeah, people. Yeah, ISSCR like supports stem cell research of all types. Excellent. Adult, embryonic, reprogrammed. I mean, it, it's, it's completely supportive of stem cell science. It has no problem with adult stem cells in particular. And many of our boards, committee chairs, speakers, active members are experts and uh, major scientists. In fact, our past president, Irv Weissman, and our president this year, Elaine Fuchs, both work on adult stem cells. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, Dr. Wiseman did some excellent immunology work. Um, here's one question. Um, if you can comment, you, don't, you, you can decline questions, by the way. Um, but, you can, um, but the question is, if you can comment on ICMS, International Cell Medicine Society, that it has a patient registry, forensic patient adverse event follow-up, and they seem to be doing... Uh, good job of retrospectively analyzing what is going on there. Is there any way to work with this group? Is there any validity, in your opinion, to what they're doing? So, so I'm not expert on ICMS or any other, or I'm not an expert on all medical and scientific societies. I mean, it is certainly the case that the ISSCR, as it tries to foster and develop this field, is reaching out and beginning to work with other scientific societies and as we said, trying to develop some international standards that everybody can agree on. Yeah. Okay, so, so obviously ISSCR w would work with any group that wants to do good science, right? Yeah. I, I believe that to be true, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, okay, excellent. Let's go back to um, some detailed scientific things. Um, do you know anything about stem cells having... Uh, pain inhibiting activity so mm -hmm. uh, uh, no I think would be the simple answer to that um, I, I think that I, I presume the question 
would probably come from somebody who is either suffering neuropathic pain or severe pain as the result of a disease process. I think there's a great deal of interest in understanding the basic biology of pain. And of course, we all hope that that kind of understanding of basic biology would lead at some point to stem cell approaches to the treatment of severe pain syndromes. But I personally am not aware of uh, major investigations in that area, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Mm -hmm. I do not know everything and would not claim to. The, the issue of pain and stem cells, because you know, we, you've made s some statements, I guess, on the media about possible adverse effects of stem cells. Um, colleagues of mine, who I know well, were involved in a a recombinant protein that activates certain stem cells, and they were using it in the context of lower back pain. And what ended up happening was actually an augmentation of the pain. So as an example of... The, 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 I, I guess I misread the question, or I mis, misunderstood the question. So it's not about the treatment of pain, but whether uh, is it likely that stem cells transplanted could cause pain. And I think we do know from the scientific literature that if you put the wrong kind of cell into the wrong kind of place in some circumstances, that yes, you could get induction of pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, the analogy I would use is that just because gasoline is safe in the gas tank, you wouldn't necessarily pour it into the radiator of a car. And so something that's safe in one place and does its job properly in one place safely it doesn't tell you that it will necessarily do so appropriately in another place. And so there are many examples in cell transplantation where cells transplanted into some parts of the nervous system can indeed generate pain. Now, it's very, it's very interesting with the pain because one of the questions was from Bob Herman, who's treated these animals with this autologous fat. And um, he's observed an analgesic-like effect. And there is, a, there is one paper that I'm thinking of right now where when you induce sciatic nerve injury in, I believe it was a rat, rat or mouse model, and you give a simple bone marrow mononuclear cell infusion, you actually see this analgesic effect. And when we talk about offshore stem cell clinics, one could be led to believe, and this is why, as you pointed out, the science needs to be done very rigorously, there could be this effect. But my curiosity is, do we know anything about, about stem cells really, a, a bone marrow mononuclear cells? So obviously it's not just stem cells in there, but having some kind of neurotrophic effect modulating pain in your experience, have you heard anything along these lines? I, I'm, I'm not expert on that particular area of neuroscience. I mean, there is evidence that there are cells derived from the macrophage lineage that find their way into the nervous system. The details of that are not clear. They're so-called microglia. They're part of inflammatory responses in some diseases, but exactly what they're doing and the rate at which they're doing it is not clear, either in animal models or in human models. A great deal more research work needs to be done to figure that out. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. One of the viewers suggested that IL-10 TGF beta inhibition and possible opioid agonist activity. It's I don't I don't know if you've seen these studies. It's it's by one of the, I forgot his name. One of uh, David Scatton, I believe, one of the big ISSCR people, and um, he demonstrated that activation of the sympathetic nervous system is essential for GCSF mobilization of stem cells. Ah, huh, interesting. And and this was published in a very high impact journal. And I do believe that this is one area that is going to be very exciting and we have to keep our eyes open for. Um, let's see here, there's some other. Have adult stem cells ever in the history of cell therapy led to adverse events? Thousands of treatments across hospitals, trials, and clinics. Oh, there are huge numbers of adverse events, of course. Um, the, the point in any application of a medical therapy is there are always risks and benefits, there are always adverse events, and part of the point of doing a rigorous, double-blind, unbiased clinical trial is to measure the adverse event frequency, the risks, against the benefits that are observed in objective studies. Yeah. No, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, here's a question that's actually, I, I believe, is from a good friend of mine, 
And um, I know we were not really talking about it, but this is a very good friend of mine, thalamic stroke. Okay. Anything, anything we know about that, anything that even on the horizon may be useful. The patient has severe chronic pain. Is a very important person whose name you probably actually would know. Um, any insight on who's doing one in thalamic stroke? Uh, you know, there are, there are a great many groups that are working on different types of stroke in general, trying to develop stem cell-based approaches. Some of them are using adult stem cells. Some of them are using embryonic type cells. I think, you know, as somebody who favors a broad portfolio of rigorous scientific and then ultimately rigorous clinical approaches, you know, one hopes that as much research as possible will be done so that we can find good treatments as rapidly as possible. Hmm. No, it's very interesting with stroke, and I'm going to introduce my little bias here, because there, and again, it, I don't like to think about it as adult stem cells versus non-adult stem cells, but it really shocked me. I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a company, I probably shouldn't say the name of the company, but both of us uh, can imagine, that uses fetal-derived progenitors, um, which I guess, according to the definition, would be called adult, but they treated one stroke patient, and um, they had international news, at the same time, there was a double-blinded, no, yeah, it was double-blinded, 130 patient stroke study with autologous mesenchymals from um, Korea, and nobody seemed to pay attention to that. So I just, I just had to get that off my chest because there is, I think, there's a lot of work being done in stroke, like you pointed out, um, but thalamic stroke, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I know it's the thalamus, but... Yeah, it's, it's a very, very interesting area. Okay, people keep asking these questions, this question here, so I really have to ask it. Um, can you name one single adverse event that happened as a result of adult stem cells? Oh, yeah. So uh, even in bone marrow transplant from unrelated donors, it's known that occasionally leukemias can be transmitted from donors to recipients. In leukemias. I think what they're asking here is in the non myeloablative case, the autologous bone marrow, uh, you know, post infarct or limb ischemia, or liver failure, any kind of these indications that comes to mind, an adverse, possible adverse event. We saw that thing, uh, you probably remember, it was, as they mentioned, the kidney. Somebody had a problem with the kidney after the stem cells. Anything come to your mind just so we can answer these guys? Uh, boy, you know, not, not a, so autologous, so that would be self-transplant. Um, you know, this is an area that's relatively new and data are beginning to accumulate. So the point is not that one can't list off a series of adverse events that have happened. It's that what one needs to do is a double-blind rigorous trial to find out what is the actual frequency of adverse events when a large number of patients are treated and do enough of the patients show improvements that it's worth whatever risk you're putting them through, either from treatment or transplant or what have you? Now it says here double blind trials have been done. Have they been done? I, I can think of a couple with a uh, heart, but. You know, I mean, I think what, what becomes a little bit uh, problematic is that no one person can know the entire scientific and medical literature. So, Perhaps there are some studies. Um, the way the system works is that if there are good quality studies that show acceptable risk-benefit profiles, then those can work their way through the regulatory system and find their way to market. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the burden is on somebody who wants to advance a therapy to market to demonstrate that the risk-benefit ratio is appropriate and in a well-regulated environment to get approval to bring that to market. No, I agree. Okay, here's a repair AMI study. Celerix is in uh, phase three. A um, couple, couple of comments there. But I think, let me maybe... Make a point here. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm not uh -huh. hostile to early stage clinical trials. Early mm -hmm. stage clinical trials are what you need to get accomplished in order to find enough information to advance to late stage late stage clinical trials, and I'm rooting for them all. Why would I not want therapies to get to people as rapidly as possible? My fundamental position is that it needs to be done in a responsible and careful way that respects ethical principles that we would all agree to in terms of protection of human subjects, and that follows the most rigorous scientific and medical uh, principles. 
No, I, I agree. I agree with that point 100%. Let me, let me maybe put it, put it this way, because there's a bunch of questions, but I don't think the people asking the questions are actually asking the right question, which maybe I'm paraphrasing, but I think the right question is this. If a patient has end-stage heart failure, and they go to somewhere, to a clinic outside of the US, and we know that the procedure is safe, now by safe, I mean that there is published 500 patient data on the safety. The safety is established, but the efficacy is not. Do, do we think that the patient should be able to make that choice if he was presented and he knows it's not effective, efficacy is not established, the safety appears to be established based on what's been done to date? Do we let the patient make that choice, or do we try to make that choice for them? I think that's what these people who are asking the questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my, my position would be that each each one of us has the right to make our own decisions about what we will choose to do, mm -hmm. but that the role of an appropriate regulatory system is to ensure that all appropriate and necessary information is available to that patient in a way that they can understand so mm -hmm. they can make a good solid decision uh, following their own principles. Excellent. Now you say that something has been established as safe based on a publication of 500 patients. In a well-regulated environment that study also has to stand up to scrutiny mm -hmm. from a review board that asks very hard questions about the quality of the data and how the study was done. Mm -hmm. And that need that kind of information is what I would argue needs to be supplied to people so they can make a truly informed and thoughtful decision. I agree, one hundred percent. So you know, we're gonna. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to wrap up momentarily yep. here. Let's We've been together up. for about an hour. Let's let's wrap it up very quickly. Here is, I guess, my bottom line, which is, or um, well, my question, which is, a lot of the viewers have said were well, saying ISSCR has a bias, this and that. How do we work? together. So for the next step, I'm thinking, there's this ISSCR committee on offshore stem cells and, you know, this and that. Who do we contact there and how do we open up that dialogue? Maybe we can have them on the TV show as well and just have some of the discussions. Well, I mean, the executive director of the society, the president of the society and the board of directors have always been open uh -huh. to discussions with other legitimate scientific and medical societies about how to work together. Excellent. Well, so who, who would you suggest that I contact? Just the, the Elaine Fuchs, you said? Well, the executive director of the society is Nancy Witte, Nancy Witte. Uh, at the society headquarters, and she is the, the conduit to appropriate society members and leadership. Sounds great, Dr. Goldstein. Thank you very much for um, telling us and teaching us a lot of really exciting things. And um, I think this is a very good step forward to opening up some really interesting dialogue and hopefully we can advance science and medicine. Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good day. So Dr. Goldstein, thank you very much. Um, I believe we made some really good progress today about understanding each other and understanding how we can advance stem cell therapy by, um, by putting the patient first. Thank you very much.